Um, were there any dollar changes? I don't think so. Um, the, the main change is where we fixed the color coding from the last time. It seems really loud. Um, we fixed the color coding issue. Remember, there were some projects that got moved out, but the color changed to the next year, so we flipped that back to the, um, the color for, for this FY20 year. Um, and then there were some changes that were not highlighted, so um, we highlighted those in yellow on the left-hand side. So I believe it's the exact same request, it's just we've cleaned up those sort of formatting issues. Thank you. Uh, what uh, we will, the, the recommendation we're looking at is to again try and have as much money into roads and sidewalks as we can this year to take care of um, some of the most critical roads that need to be addressed um, and uh, get some significant progress in the year that is possible to do so and um, take care of an issue that is uh, of critical concern to the town and to its, our residents and our road users. Um, but the, to do that, we have to make decisions on postponing other things, which is uh, what was presented at the end of the last meeting and that we'll pick up again on today. Um, so I don't know, uh, Paul, do you have anything that you want to add about the uh, uh, need to make this shift to try and get as much into roads as sidewalks as possible? Sure. Um, so this has been a clear uh, and articulated need by the council and individually and by members of the community for quite some time. We addressed it in a significant way with funding last year we want to continue that this year, and, and we, w we have plugged in that number for the year, years going out. Um, our mission with this um, pr um, budget today is to balance the FY20 budget. The way we accomplished that was by saying, by moving a number of uh, required, uh, uh, desired and required things out a year, especially a lot of vehicles. So that's the way we're balancing it this year. Next year will be a, a bigger challenge, I think. So um, I think that it's important that um, the committee be able to ask questions about the things that are being postponed or anything that they are concerned about I was wondering if the best way to do it um, using the format that's before us is to go through page by page each section, noting the ones that are highlighted for post where there is a significant postponement uh, to future year. I think nothing was eliminated, right? There was, it was just a question of timing of the year that it was proposed. Nothing dropped off the list. There, I think there was a one. Um, there was one item that did come off the list because there was an alternative funding source. I think it was the housing production plan. Um, okay. So that came off, but that's highlighted too, I believe. Yeah. So in the original request, we um, had amounts at each school, and then the pr change between the original department request and the version we presented last week is that we um, put those amounts into the school-wide, um, I think it's interior upgrades. Um, and the rationale was that setting the amounts by school sort of locked us into spending that amount at each school as opposed to prioritizing where the greatest need was. Um, so we moved those amounts, and, and it got lowered. It was originally 50,000 at each school, so 150,000 total. That got lowered to 100,000, and we put it in the um, district-wide account above, which when we get to that section, if you want to go section by section, I can point out. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, again, about when we get there, the highlight was that it went from something to zero. Um, well, I was, that one came up, I, would it be easier to go, I'm mean, looking for everybody's um, input here to go through it and first deal with equipment and then come back and do, do each section, yes. but at least to start with equipment. Can I step up and show you that? Yes. So the, um, the housing production plan is removed because it has funding elsewhere, but I guess just, again, so I can keep my head screwed on straight about what, because I feel like we have other items that have funding elsewhere, so what goes on here and what, like should it be removed or should it have shading to show different funding? Yeah, that's a good question. I can um, follow up with Sonia and see if it should be put back on with just a different shading. Yeah, I mean, I had the same um, reaction is that um, we probably need, in and this is the future year discussion because we're, we're, we are where we are today, so, but it's for, so the next year discussion is that we received a number of requests which are labeled as um, by prior, priority need by the presenters is high, highest priority, high priority. And the, um, for the ones that are in those two categories, that um, there be a separate listing of what happens with each one so that it's easy to track. And then we can really focus on it, yes. So I think that this is a, the thing you have in front of you is a working document, so rather than make permanent edits, the idea was to highlight the changes so you could see where the changes were. When you finalize that, you probably would just remove it uh, because it's been addressed someplace else. But at this point, I think Sean and Sonia were trying to be transparent about what has changed instead of making the changes and have it be, this is sort of like a track edits approach to it. So, no, I think that's helpful. So, uh, equipment. Let's see if there are questions that any, anything, we did talk a little bit about the ladder truck at the last meeting and the, yes. I, I do have a question um, on the IT and this could just be me trying to m merge the individual capital packets to this document where the lines don't map, I mean lines started going missing. Um, you highlighted the I information systems other departments, and that is a large number. Um, and is that the rest of the IT capital requests? Because there was the IT needs, which seemed to be listed separately on this new capital plan. But then there was like department needs and library needs. Are all of those merged into this yellow highlighted line? Or am I missing, like I can't seem to find them anywhere else. The, the 275 is a combination of three separate projects that sort of fall under that category. Um, I'll have to pull out the sheet, I've got it here. Um, but the, the change in that section was, originally there was I think um, 40 or $50,000 in there for the LSSE rec track software. Um, we had a discussion on that about maybe that should come out of the operating or we need to look at that closer. So that was removed, and but then it was also replaced with um, a, a, the same amount for, I think it's inventory, some sort of inventory software, uh, looking into how we can um, better track our inventory in town, vehicles, and, and other inventory. So that's why that's highlighted. So the actual amount, I don't think changed from the original request, but the, one of the projects got flipped. It, the amount actually went up 10,000 then, I think, from the capital. Um, okay. Because you took 40 out and put 50 in then, so I'm, I'm getting that. Where are the library needs that were on the departmental IT request then, the 26.8 for infrastructure replacement. So that's on the next page. Okay, yep. <laughs> thanks. This is why I'm, I'm not getting the whole tra transfer over to one set of files to another, okay. And make note of all these things, because again, we're gonna look for your feedback on ways to improve the 
functionality of the, of the spreadsheet and the process probably at the next time we meet. So any of these frustrating things, just make notes so that we can look into them. Yes, Eric. Um, someone else on the committee may remember this, or the town manager, Sean, might know this. Um, Please um, use your mics. Oh, what? Oh, it is, it, my mic's on. I just bring it closer, okay, sorry. Not usually accused of mumbling. Uh, for fiber optic INET, um, I, I, I was trying to look at quickly in my notes to see if I could find out the answer to this, but I'm just curious whether we know that we have a high degree of confidence, uh, not that all $589,000 is needed, which I'm sure it is, but do we have a high degree of confidence that it all will actually be spent in uh, FY20? Or do we think it's possible that, I mean, just given the complexity of doing that kind of work, that some significant portion of it might bleed over into FY21? And I'm only asking the question because logically it's so much money that if, if it was likely that only half of it was going to get spent or something, that would leave, that would free up money for other, other needs um, and then still allow it to be slugged into 2021. And I just can't remember the answer that we got. Oh. Uh, so this comes out of the, this comes out of a different funding source oh, right. because it comes from the Comcast money and it will be, be borrowed in it in, with the money that Comcast pays us over every year. And under the terms of our contract with Comcast, we have to replace the um, INET loop that the town uses um, within two years. Yeah. So that's, a, that's very helpful because it answered, the, it answered the question and the reason I didn't remember it is it may actually bleed over into the following year, but it doesn't matter because the funding's just different. So, oh, Tammy. Does line one include the schools, or is that just town IT? Just town. Okay. Maybe it should say town IT. Um, yeah, again, I think those type, type of things yeah. make note of it, and we'll, um, yeah. IT under other departments. Right, there's library, there's schools, yeah. I'm sorry, but what is the source of funds for the protective gear? It just says other sources. I'm, I can't remember. Is it fire? Yeah. Thirty-two. Yeah, it says other, it's under other. Is that the ambulance fund? No. It shouldn't be. I don't think it is. I would say that because uh, ambulance funds is uh, a different color. Yeah, and that's something I'll have to double check with um, Sonia what the other source was. So. And I'll double check it. It may have been closing out old articles. For some reason, I vaguely remember that. Um, but I'll confirm if that's what it was. So, so can I request for future years that that line 32 protective gear, when the fire department came in front of us, they said it would be an annual request like going forward that they aim to. And it stops after three years. So can we get it on the full 10 year just for accuracy purposes? Sticking with equipment for a moment longer to see if there's anything else. And I don't think, I mean, eventually I want to get into the discussion of the citizen requests, but I don't think there are any citizen requests that fall under equipment, so this isn't the time to do that. Okay, Tammy. I'd like to re reiterate a comment I made last week. And then it really concerns me that, that all this is pushed um, 
you know, there's a lot in FY21, and then we're pushing things in FY21. Um, so it, it just really concerns me because I think roads are gonna still remain a priority and what do we do with all these requests for equipment that we're pushing out? Just rhetorical comment. I mean, I think that that's an, action, an, um, an important point that we either need to make or include in our report, but the road question and future year question is something that is a significant issue that um, to the extent that we want to get some of the roads done because we want to make some visible progress that our um, community thinks is important, we, if we agree that it's important, um, but at some point we're not going to be able to continue to do this and meet our other needs. Paul? So every year we have more capital needs than we have um, resources and our mission is always to how do we get to zero for this cap this fiscal year which is what we've attempted to do and that automatically pushes things out and you'll see every year has more needs than resources and uh, we, we can refine this more I think uh, for the, at least for the first five years we get a little bit closer to what is likely to be reality um, but we also didn't want to lose the needs being articulated in the capital plan. And on a side note, uh, Sonia just said that uh, on the fire, she, she's on her way to see her granddaughter, or her grandson uh, in Denver, so, but she did say that the um, protective gear was from old capital. So can I ask a question about that? If it's from old capital, is it a pro I, I guess when we figure out like how much money we have, does that mean in theory this year our budget can be forty thousand dollars over what is funding this year because it lets it it won't come out of this number then? Count and then they can be reappropriated for other capital needs. So they still have to be reappropriated through this process and through the approval process. Um, but it's sort of like having a little bit more than the, the levy. Yeah, I mean, as I look at the, uh, just in the general discussion that we've been having, on the very first page, the total requests line for the next two years, 21 and 22, a lot has been put in there. And uh, so it seems like every year we do this, we just be, keep pushing out. At some point, it may be important to have a discussion about can we really afford to do all of this and are we going to have to take things off the list totally? Are we misleading ourselves and our community by putting more on the list than we can have on the list? Yeah, I mean some of that, it's true that there's more requests, but there's also some of that are the building projects and so it really inflates the, the number um, in terms of it adds the total cost as opposed to the annual uh, debt payments. So again, that's something maybe to look at in the future, how we set it up. It, it makes, you know, the 53 million for next year's request is, includes the, the, the cost of a building, essentially, or part of the cost of a building, not the actual debt payment that the uh, town would make that year. So it's a little misleading looking at it that way. You know, that, that's actually a good point, because if you look at the first page, again, a couple lines up at buildings, it uh, illustrates the point you're just making. Uh, so maybe we should separate out buildings from other requests a little bit so that we can track, at least we'll feel a little better about it. Because uh, the buildings, ultimately, we're, if we're going to build them, we're going to have to find other sources of funding, like a debt exclusion but override. The, the sources are listed and include the numbers for the buildings for borrowing and debt exclusion. So, so that negative number in sort of the third grouping on the first page includes the yeah. 
borrowing for the buildings too and and the requests you know both yeah. the revenue yeah. and the spending side so that five million is beyond the borrowing right i'm just talking about somebody's looking like 53 million you know above that that's it's true but that's not actually the um outlay of cash um from the town but i'm not even looking at the totals i mean i'm just on the equipment page and um Public Works is 170,000 this year, 733 for next year, 485. Conservation is no vehicles, 151. Cherry Hill no vehicles, 380,000 in 21. I mean, I just it, it's just everything's getting pushed out. Um, I wasn't even looking at the total page. I'm just looking at the you know the individual um, department equipment needs. Yeah, I think I think the the interesting challenge. For me, because I can understand that you have, that we have more requests than we have money, and that's always true. I do actually think it makes sense to find a way to organize this differently and separate out things that are actually being invested in and expended in this year versus borrowed long term. I'd say that'd be true for equipment as well. I mean, anything that's being borrowed long term, there should be some way of accounting for those things separately so you understand it, but also then you got to carry for it, obviously. What is that obligation going to look like in future years? Because even if you're borrowing, if you're choosing to borrow something really expensive this year, that would actually logically crowd out borrowing you could do in future years, right? So you got to you got to account for that and be able to show it somehow. But the hard thing is, and it goes back to it's kind of funny because it goes back to my ladder truck um, uh, uh, question last week, um, and it was uh, it, the the departments come forward, and I know. Forgive me, because I know that for the town manager, this is what you deal with every day. But but that the departments come forward. They make a compelling case that they have various equipment needs. It's very hard uh, for us, certainly sitting here, to be able to ascertain, uh, even if something's at sort of the book usable life of, of, a, of a piece of equipment, um, what condition is it really in? Is it likely that it'll be able to last two or three or more years? And how, do you, and how do you stratify the requests in a way so that you can know, get a better sense? There's no certainty. But a better sense of, for the things we're pushing off to 21 and 22, how many of those things do we have a sense of can actually probably last two or three more years? In a perfect world where you had all the money you needed, you knew we wouldn't do it. But the reality is, you know, you can probably figure out a way to get there. And then there are other things that are more likely to break down or more likely to need um, replacing. And I'm, I'm sure that in the budget you're putting forward as your, your ideas and recommendation, um, you're already doing that, essentially. You're already making an assessment of things that are at a breaking point. But, but it, the hard part is figuring out how do you do that and look out at a couple of years? Because to me, the extent of whatever significant challenge we have in terms of how we're looking at our borrowing capacity and all our needs partially has to be filtered through that lens of, of you know, over the next five years, what do we think is actually likely to come up in a more urgent way versus those things that Look, everyone's always going to have needs, and they're legitimate. But, and I'm I'm not quite sure how to make sense of it. But I but I have a, a strong sense that even looking right now at these FY 21 and 22 things that have been deferred, that we don't have good visibility into disaggregating that list. Yep. Paul. John, are you going to respond to? Oh, you go first. So, so I think that's a really good point, and I think we've recognized that, that that is, there's a lot that's been pushed out, there's a lot that's been articulated to say, how do we make a judgment about that? And I think one of the things that um, we talked about the inventory, and people, uh, counselors have asked for more detailed information and assessments of the condition of vehicles and buildings, and that's what we hope, it's our, I think it's our job to get that to you so you can make a more informed dis, um, decision uh, next year as we sort of spend some time getting this organized. I think the schools have done a good job on it. So, for instance, for their ADA um, requirements, they had someone come in, do a full assessment of all their buildings, prioritize things, talk about what, what things cost, and now there's a plan. And we don't have that for a lot. We have the individual departments who are really smart about what their needs are, and then they sort of put that in front of, from in front of you, and then you're like, wow, that's pretty compelling, but what do we do with that? So it's, I think what we want to do is present a more coherent plan to you based on actual 
data and uh, inspections of vehicles and, and buildings. Yeah, um, I, I just see in the, 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 the buildings, of course, uh, I, a lot of people are no longer aware of this because it's been a while, but there, when Ron Bahanowitz was still um, with us, and uh, I think actually it was back still when John was town manager, um, we did do a building inventory and it was fairly complete analysis of uh, report on what each building is, the age of the building and the condition of the buildings and um, actually found it and have it on my, up on my screen at home on the computer because I just found it a couple of days ago again. But we don't have, uh, we haven't updated that and we haven't done anything with the uh, vehicles at all. Um, and so I just wanted to, Alex. So I guess I want to expand on Eric's comment. And a lot of times when the different departments come in front of us, what we're hearing, especially relative to vehicles, is the expense to their operating budget to maintain. And I guess I'm just thinking every year we're taking a half percent away from operating budget and putting it toward capital, which I think is a good thing. But I, I guess, and you know, we're only talking capital here, but I'm trying to think big picture from department to department as we're asking them to trim their operating budgets and yet we're putting off purchases which are going to increase their operating budget needs. And so I guess I just put that out there. I mean, that's sort of my thought process it not only just pushing costs out further, but it, it creates, I feel like all our departments are fairly strained to begin with, and this just puts an added strain on them. On a separate note, um, earlier you asked other changes that happened from last time to this time, and one other thing I wanted to point out, which actually makes the future look worse, is we did increase the roads. Remember, it went from a million, I think it went down to 300,000 going forward. We changed that to a million, so now that is in there. Um, and also the sidewalks are 200,000 going forward. So that is reflected in that number, which is one of the reasons why it got a little worse. Okay, that is helpful, it did. So do we want to move on from? I have just one more yeah. um, I'm, I'm trying to, again, go from the packets we got to this document and school IT requests. Um, you said telecommunications was removed, but there were no actual telecommunications requests for FY20. But I see Five, multimedia equipment requests that I don't see moved. So I think it was multimedia requests that was uh, removed. Is that right? Yeah, sorry. Um, it should be multimedia. Yeah. And then the copiers are not on the IT requests. They're in the regular school budget request. Is that right? Yeah, so <laughs> okay. I, I do the copiers. So we, we deal with the state contracts and the purchasing. Okay. So that comes from the business office. OK. There should be a separate packet um, that has just the copier in it. No. Yeah. I have to admit that was one of the copiers I was looking for last night, too. It must be in the school packet. It is. It is. It is. I found it, but it. I gave a so, very brief presentation on it. So, do we want to go um, on to buildings? Yes. I, I guess on the, um, the Bangs Community Center, the kitchen equipment, so that was moved out to FY21, but I think Sonia said she's not sure we would even need it because we may have old capital that we try to use first. So I assume that's a number that might move back in, but show, like that's, we don't really know where that is, I guess. Yeah. She wants to check on what's available currently before, so I don't think it's gonna be part of the request for next year, or part of this request for next year. So it's not something you would be doing during the year either. The timing, I'm not sure, but again, I, I think that's the one that she said there's some 
all the additional funding outside of this for um, that we have to look at first. So it might get highlighted in that bright blue color. Put yeah. back to some year or highlighted even in next year in that bright blue, but highlighted in bright blue. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to go through the schools and at all. Are we going to do the uh, on the or with buildings or? Yeah, let's, um, we can do schools, and I think that if we're going to do schools, then we should probably um, also get into the citizen request piece that has to do with schools and buildings. Right. And uh, so go ahead. The only reason I was doing that is because because of, um, A, the memo that you, that, uh, that Mr. McDonough prepared, um, and uh, B, just that there were, people may recall last week we had a, there were moving parts. The lines were moved around, and I thought it was just worth going through that again um, in more, you know, make sure people understand what actually happened and why and all that kind of stuff. So there were three main changes to the school building uh, request. Um, so the first change was around the HVAC, uh, and in particular the chiller system. Mm -hmm. So there was 400,000 at Fort River for a complete replacement and 400,000 at Wildwood for a complete replacement. Right. We had conversations here about, you know, how can we preserve, you know, the, the safety of the school and the students and the staff, um, but also try to do it as financially responsible as possible, um, given there is the potential for a new building in the future and um, can we, is there a lower cost way to manage that? Um, so we went back, um, met with the facility director and the superintendent, and so the, the change was we pushed the 400,000 at each of those schools out to FY21, which is, again, one of the reasons why FY21 looks higher, um, because we don't want to say for sure that we're not going to need those, a complete replacement at this point. Um, we want to try out this alternative plan and see how it works. Um, and so the alternative plan was to put $130,000 more into where it says, where is it? Uh, the highlighted yellow energy management HVAC systems upgrade. Um, it's not totally descriptive of what's in that, that section, but I'll, I'll go through it. Um, so that section before was 80,000, and we added 130,000 to it. Um, and the 130,000 was comprised of 80,000 for the rental of a portable chiller system for six months or the chilling season, uh, $20,000 for site work at each school to make the buildings ready to take a portable chiller in the event that it needs it so that there wasn't um, a, a lag or uh, amount of time that was spent doing that. So we want to get the buildings ready where it could just be hooked up. Um, and then 30000 to buy a new compressor. The compressor is the part of the chiller system that um, it's very expensive, it's $30,000, and it has a significant lead time to get, uh, and they're hard to, to get, and so we wanted to get one of those on hand, so if the chiller goes in the Fort River unit, we could replace the, comp or if the compressor goes in the chiller at Fort River, we could replace that compressor. Um, that's the part that went in Wildwood last year, and that's been replaced at Wildwood, the, the compressor. So that was the chiller system change. 400,000 at each school pushed out a year, um, and in its place, we've added 130,000 for the portable chiller, the site work, and the compressor. 30,000 for the compressor. Mm -hmm. That was change number one. Um, the other two. Um, we have a question. Uh, it, yes. It, it was. It's not necessarily against that um, line 208 new feasibility, um, and line 209 new school is sort of duplicated in line 247 new school? Yeah, we talked about that should go down to the building. Can we get the, the new building. feasibility into line 247 and yeah. delete 208 and 209 so yep. we see sort of the whole progression of that? Absolutely. I also, if we actually were, when we are approved in December, <laughs> I thought we had to come up with that feasibility money immediately. The 
the amount of time once you get approved to get the authorization, the authorization is what I understand. Okay, but this puts it all the way into 22. I can't imagine that. Um, that was sort of built in. Yeah. Right, if we get approved, then there would have to be, I think it's, I'll have to double check with the superintendent, I believe it's six to nine months or something that you have to get the authorization, uh, the funding. So you're saying the earliest that we would need it is FY21, not 22. FY20 to 21. Yeah, I'll have to right. double check the timing. So yeah. we should move that placeholder that's, to the correct year. That's exactly what I'm suggesting. Make that change. We would, uh, I mean, it's, it's shaded, to, it appears to be shaded to indicate that we would do it by borrowing. That one's shaded as debt exclusion, which is probably not what we would do with that either, the feasibility portion. So we yeah. should shade it to borrowing instead of debt exclusion. Yeah, so I mean, it, it would probably be a borrowing at first, and then how that borrowing was paid back potentially could be a debt exclusion. So I think that's why it, it might be that, a weird color. Good. But you wouldn't do a debt exclusion until you um, had a number for the project, and you can't do that without the feasibility work. The, last time we did the project, we never got to the school construction piece. We stopped at the feasibility, so we just ended up paying it back. I'm not sure if we actually kept going through the process, if we, how we would pay back that feasibility piece, if it would be rolled forward into a larger borrowing or not. We'd have to talk with our financial advisor about that. So, um, Alex, and then I want to, yeah, yeah. No, no, if, uh, then I want to also point out that this is the perfect place to be asking the question about the citizen request that has to do with doing some initial feasibility work around Crocker and uh, suggesting that we move that, make yeah. that in more immediate Should I do the final sense. two changes real quick? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we moved the, the replacements out one year at 400,000 each and just doing quick math, right? Like assuming we've already prepped both sites, I assume if needed, is there a new compressor at each site or is the 30,000 just one that follows just one. one? Okay. Yeah. So let's hypothetically say both systems, like we, we rent this one for FY20 uh, and then if both systems go out, right, for 80,000, per for four years, we're still less than 800, 000. like I guess I'm trying to figure, like I assume we're just gonna revisit this again next year and see where the systems are. Yeah, so so the number, we pushed it out because again, we don't know the if we're gonna get into the MSBA process this coming year or not. Um, so we don't really know how long we're gonna need to have sort of this portable unit fix. It, you know, if it's 10 years, then we're gonna wanna replace the chillers. If it's four to five years, then this might work. Um, but, it, you know, something could happen this summer where we're like, all right, we need to replace these chillers. So that's why we felt comfortable pushing it back a year, but not taking it off the list for now. Okay, um, so they'll basically, they'll basically be a placeholder once we know the timing and can do the theoretical math, and then we'll fill it in from there. Right. Okay. Eric? No, I was just going to emphasize the same point, that this is something where if you're looking for spongy numbers in, in, in uh, 21, this would be an ideal spongy number where we might not be spending actually 800000 you might be spending 80 again, but, or not. But the point is, there's, there, if, if all goes well, then that'd be the case. So, uh, getting back to the, the, the feasibility and the, uh, is there any thought as, would the feasibility work eventually include Crocker, um, and if, if that was correct, then um, what about the points that were made in support of the citizen request to do that work a little bit earlier? So, so that was one of the three questions, I think, was would the MSPA fund um, the Crocker Farm facility study as part of the other process? Um, and so I checked with the superintendent, and he was very clear that the MSBA won't make a definitive response or give a definitive answer on that until we're in a feasibility study. Um, so I don't think we're going to get uh, a definitive answer on that, whether they would fund anything at Crocker Farm um, until we're in the, actual, in the actual pipeline with them. And I guess the related question is, 
if we funded something early, started working on it as we did with Fort River, that's not something that they would consider reimbursement for, or would it be something they would consider reimbursement for? They don't give definitive answers on those things until you're in the pipelines. So I don't think that we spent the money before we're in the process. I don't think they would give us reimbursement for it. Um, the question is whether anything from that study could be used um, to maybe make the process go faster or less expensive. Um, and that I don't know either, but I don't think they would reimburse for anything prior to being accepted. Um, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't. That, my understanding is your understanding, and that is they won't reimburse for what we did prior. The real issue is whether or not the studies themselves will be sufficient so we don't have to redo them. Would, so could, I, I have a question about the feasibility. So um, we won't get an answer from MSBA, it sounds like, on the Crocker Farm issue until we're in. But could we plug this feasibility study into this year's capital plan? It doesn't need to start say immediately, but it could, if we've plugged it into this year's plan, potentially start slightly earlier once we hear in December before we would need another vote, especially if once we're in, we can get an answer fairly quickly about it that it would or would not be funded. I, I'm just thinking timing-wise, is it smart to plug it into this year's fiscal capital plan? Yeah, that, that relates to one of the other questions. So. Um, Again, we're not opposed to the, the schools, aren't opposed to the facility study. Um, so if, if the council, you know, if we find a way to plug that in and balance everything, I think that's good. Um, but in terms of how we would prioritize it, we wouldn't, for the school facility requests, we wouldn't reduce any of those school facility requests because they're all really for sort of immediate building needs. Um, you know, the roof, the HVAC stuff. Um, so we wouldn't substitute it for anything that's on our proposal already, especially since we reduced it quite a bit. Um, but if there's a way to, to add it, um, again, rework, reworking, I mean, there's, we know there's already $20,000, sort of a, a small surplus at this point that needs to be allocated before we close this out. Um, so there, there is some wiggle room, um, but it sort of needs the bigger picture discussion about where that would come from. Yes. So I guess what I'm really struggling with is I'm, I'm not following the school as close, I mean, probably more than others, but less than I probably should. But so I, I mean, if, if it truly speeds us along and we need to make it a priority and it gets us to building schools faster, then, you know, sorry, it's Paul, we take 40 grand out of the roads like we did last year because it's our priority. But if it's potentially duplicative and doesn't get us the information, I mean, I guess I know everyone wants to be like, like if we need it, it's gonna speed up the process, I say we find the money. But if that's not really the case, if it just sounds good but it's not the reality, then that's a different situation and I don't have those answers to make that decision. It'd be cool if I did because then I could make it, you know, then I could advocate one way or the other. And I don't, we don't have those answers either. Again, it's, <laughs> the MSPA is not gonna um, give a definitive response on whether yes, you can use that work um, or no, you can't or, or they'll include it or they won't include it. They're just not going to give us the, the exact response or the definitive response. I get that, but I, to me, there is a difference between if you were starting, I'll just give an example. I think on the Fort River Feasibility Study, some of the work that's being done is sort of doing concept, conceptual uh, design for a new Fort River Elementary School. I could imagine the MSBA saying that stuff you can throw out because we want you to go through your process and we're not interested in the, you're not gonna take a conceptual design and just sort of translate it into a final design and move yourself forward. Um, on the other hand, I would, I would hope and I would think you could probably, we could probably find out based on comparable, I mean districts who've also gone through this kind of stuff, that if you've done some sort of, let's say engineering analysis or a site analysis and you're getting just basic engineering data back on building conditions, that some, some of that analysis you would hope would be able to pour it into accelerating the work you're doing. So in a similar case here, it, what I think if, if I understood correctly the request around Crocker, it's looking at the previous site analysis and surveys and then 
starting to conceptually sketch out where you could put uh, a couple extra classrooms and some rooms here and there without getting down to the level of any kind of actual really design proposal. And I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out whether we could even find the question out not about whether or not you're going to guarantee that we can use this going forward, which I get they're not going to say as a matter of protocol, but more has, are there other examples of districts that have been able to use sort of basic underlying analysis to inform their work? Because part of me would say, we're, I mean, when you start these projects, presumably they're going to take the original geotechnical surveys that were done back when Wildwood and Fort River were constructed, right? So that's previous survey work that's being incorporated into the work you're doing. You're obviously doing, you know what I'm getting at? Like you already have a body of work, every district has a body of work that you're incorporating into the work you're doing to learn something. You know, you're never starting purely from scratch in a literal sense. Yeah, again, not opposed to the, the project. Um, and I think you probably, and, and maybe, um, oh, she, she left. Um, I was gonna say maybe the requester could give a little more, uh, oh, oh, sorry, so, did Maria leave? Oh, Maria wasn't, oh, okay. Um, maybe Tony can speak to it. Um, you probably do have to get into a little bit of the designing piece of it because some of it is looking at the renovation piece of it, of Crocker Farm, um, and the, the impact of making the gym bigger and the impact of making the library bigger and things like that, which I think in order to really cost estimate, you'd have to have some sort of baseline design of what that would look like. Um, is that your understanding too? So the main purpose of this is to first find out if the site actually can be expanded because the K-6 proposal that Dr. Morris proposed includes expansion of Crocker Farm, so that's a requirement as part of his proposal. And then the second part um, is you know, a, a rough cost because we might find out it's cost prohibitive to expand a Crocker Farm. And if that's the case, then we're, we're narrowing down our options. So once we get into the feasibility process with the MSBA, we have a much clearer idea of which way we're going. And I think that will definitely accelerate the process. By how many months, I'm not sure. But it's not so much what would a design look like for an expansion. I don't think this study would get anywhere near that. I think it's basically, can you expand and roughly what, it would, what would it cost? And that will help us, well, first of all, it's a requirement for the K through six scenario. And secondly, for the K through five, it could be an option that might be preferable to the residents to have two smaller schools instead of one large school and one small school and the inequities that would be inherent in that. Thank you. Yeah. My concern about, I, I, I'm just sorry I wasn't in the room last week, although I did hear your uh, presentation. I heard it was quite good. Um, and, but my concern is that if we actually move forward with the K-5 and we put the sixth grade at the middle school, then it's not clear that this study would be at the same level. And I just, you know, again, this may be my not understanding the whole picture, but um, from what I have understood thus far is would, there is a way to put the sixth grade in the middle school, and there may even be a very strong academic argument for why we would want to do that. So if putting money into a study of how to expand Crocker Farm to accommodate sixth grade, to me seems premature. That's my concern. I mean, of all of the citizen projects, I think this is the one that is most compelling. But, and because clearly the support to move forward on the schools is unanimous. <laughs> uh, but that's my concern. I, I just want to echo, well, unless my mic goes in now, Alex's, um, you know, I, I may know a little more than Alex about this, but. I think we need to, real, I, I, I'm looking towards our school committee members for some sort of guidance on is this a study that number one, 
in terms of what the residents have requested would need to be done should we get in the MSBA program um, process at the sort of point, as, as Lynn sort of said, with those sort of ideas being looked at, is that going to need to be done, number one? And um, if it is going to need to be done, is it something that our school committee thinks is preferable to start now because of what may or may not the cost of, say, the feasibility study that we know the MSBA will chip in to help pay for, um, because that's going to hit, as the presenters last week said, a maximum. And so if it's going to hit that maximum no matter what, why not start this early? I think I'm looking for some guidance from our experts over here on what the timing you think is best for this potential, since I think I'm hearing something's going to meet, need to be done for feasibility at Crocker, and is this resident request on point with what would need done, and should we be starting it early? I'll, I'll start and then let Eric chime in and add anything more. Um, so to answer your first question, yes, it should be done, and it will need to be done at some point. Um, and I think that's, that's the million dollar question, right? Is what, is what is the exact timing that we need? I think there's, um, it, it's, it's complete uncertainty and I actually really like your suggestion of putting the plug in so that if we can, if we do get in um, in December and we can get started on this, that we, that we actually do. Um, but it is a question mark for me, really, um, still in terms of the timing, particularly when we see that we're not putting in spending for the full feasibility study until 2021, right? So in my mind, the two should be happening either in quick succession or at the same time. So if we're saying that we're not going to be able to start realistically the feasibility, the full feasibility, so that 400,000 until 2021, in my mind, that would be about the same time that we would wanna be spending on any other feasibility studies that could not be included. Um, if, we, if we did think though um, that we could start early in 2021 with that big one, then I would say definitely let's put it in as a placeholder and know that that is something that we, we may not need in the end once we get the answers from MSBA about whether it could be included. Right, and I think that, I think that all that makes total sense and I, to me, and I, and I think that um, the point that was made earlier also that you're gonna hit the maximum of what's reimbursable is I think highly likely. And so I, it, in that sense, it's likely that if it's not this, it's going to be something else we're spending money on that's good, that is going to have to be paid out of the town. I think on the, on the point about moving the sixth grade to the middle school and then the necessity of doing uh, any expansion at Crocker, I think the challenge for us, and this is, this is like a, it's, it's a fascinating challenge and it's a real one, is that we have a number of balls in the air that we're trying to assess whether we think it's a good idea and whether we think we should do it. And um, I'd say two things. One, in terms of literally whether we want to do it and whether the, ultimately the superintendent's gonna recommend it and think it's the right thing to do, we genuinely don't know yet. <laughs> and then also as a matter of public confidence because we recognize these conversations are dynamic. So they involve parents, they involve staff, they involve feedback from students. And so those, the, 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 the public conversation we have around what we're choosing to do is, as you know, a meaningful input into whether ultimately we're gonna think a particular set of recommendations or something we wanna move forward with. I'm saying all that because anyone looking at where we are right now could logically say that in a couple of years time, we're gonna have the sixth grade in the middle school um, for any variety of reasons, we're gonna think we can get well reimbursed to do one uh, larger K through five, and that there's not a need for any expansion at Crocker. But what I would say is that the conversation we were having through all the listening sessions in which the superintendent and the school committee was saying, we don't actually know that. And so there are, there, there are strong concepts on the table, but that's exactly what they are, they're concepts. Um, argues, argues for the, the likelihood that, and particularly because it's something we've talked about before with the MSBA, that the MSBA does require districts to um, flesh out different alternatives and kick the tires on them. And so the likelihood that we would wanna look at 
um, a K6 expansion for Crocker is, as Allison said, you know, the superintendent himself has said is a very high confidence that he has that we would need, in fact, to look at that scenario. And I'll, I'll say again, although I'm not, a, I'm not conceptually, I mean, speaking personally, I'm not conceptually opposed to the idea of looking at balancing 480 and 480. Um, when our school committee has talked about this and when the superintendent's talked about it, he actually hasn't been talking about, none of us have been talking about, the notion of balancing out two smaller schools um, as, a, as the part of the proposal that was being brought forward. We've never, we haven't ruled it out, but we've never actually been talking about that. What we've been literally just talking about is if we keep two K6s, um, how, do we, how do we suss out um, the viability of expanding on Crocker? Can I just? Yeah. Um, I I'm, I'm still need more clarification. If we find out on December 12th, I think is the magical date, um, that we are in the MSBA process, then it takes, you, we're using months, it takes a certain amount of months to then engage for the feasibility. I really, the reason I'm asking this is because, yes, we've now said, okay, the 400,000, which is an approximate amount, um, needs to be in FY21. Does, it, I mean, is there any reason to put some in FY20? Because even losing three months of getting going is, in my mind, is critical at this point. It's a good question. I think some of it relates to our change in government. So in the past, primarily, there were two opportunities to appropriate money um, or make these sort of decisions, you know, yeah. spring and fall town meeting. Um, now, you know, I'm looking at Paul, but you can make those decisions twice a month. Um, so if we find out on December 12th we're in, you know, the, the lead time to make a decision on approving a borrowing, for example, to uh, meet what the MSBA needs, um, it's not the same as it was before, but I think, again, given that change, I probably want to go back and get, you know, talk with the town manager and the superintendent um, and see if you're right, if we should put something in FY20 or if we feel FY21 is good. I, yeah. I want to echo Lynn here. You know, we don't have to wait till, like That's in previous, right. when we got in, you waited till Springtown meeting in May and you appropriated it for the next year. If we're in in December, the council could act in January to appropriate feasibility so it starts immediately. Right. And if that's the case and we want to plan and plan for being in the system, we probably should have that feasibility money allocated in FY20 with planned borrowing, not even 21. Yeah. That's, I mean, I yeah, we'll have to look at the timeline because there's significant, it's quite possible it could be FY20. I'll just, the last time around this process, there's quite a bit of lead time. Um, in terms of doing the procurements to get the OPM and get the designer on board. Um, but it is possible that FY20, like April or Mar uh, April, May or June, we might have bills to pay, so. so I, think, I think that we need to remember that uh, what we're principally working on right now is what our recommendations are to go into the budget for FY20 for capital. And once we make that recommendation, of course, then it's up to the town manager to decide whether he wants to accept the recommendation. But, um, and furthermore, even if um, money is put into something, um, if it turns out unwise to spend it, it doesn't get spent. So there's a couple of additional trigger points along the way. Um, the question of where we put the bulk of the feasibility money which year is, you know, it's, it's really where it goes on a spreadsheet, but in reality, you're absolutely right. When we hear that we have uh, been invited into the process, uh, whatever year that is, that's the point when the council is going to immediately jump to say, okay, we need to put a chunk of money into it and borrow it. Um, I think that our question right now is, um, really should we take a sum of money or, or recommend that a sum of money from this year's K-6 
capital, assuming we're not borrowing and assuming that we just don't know the answer to this, be made available for um, initial feasibility work, um, which would then have both of those um, trigger points that go beyond because the manager would have to decide whether he wants to accept that recommendation and reduce some, something else, probably roads by the whatever amount. And of course, we don't know what that amount is, which is another problem that I'm having in dealing with this. Um, and uh, furthermore, wouldn't make a decision to spend it unless things have been um, worked out with the superintendent that it is a wise, thoughtful thing to do. Yeah, Lynn? Yeah. But Mandy, I'm sorry, Mandy Joe and I were having a side conversation. What we're both saying is that in FY20, I would put a figure in of $440,000 to cover what we think we need as the match for MSBA and what we think we need to do the Crocker Farm. I, I, I'd even make sure that MSBA knows we've done that. But if, um, if you put 440000 in, is it, uh, is it all under borrowing or is it um, 400 under borrowing and forty under something else? I, I leave that to the town manager to decide. <laughs> but that was going to be along my lines of are you taking... 40,000 out of roads, are you cutting something? Where are you getting the 40,000 from? Because theoretically that's part of what we've done in the past is, but, um, so I don't know if anyone, I don't yeah. know if everyone's in agreement to just leave it to the town manager or. And there's 20,000 right now, again, that isn't spoken for, so. Yeah, I, I guess I also, and maybe you had this conversation last week, but I wanna go back to the logic around the money for DPW in this year. That's a lot of money, and given that we have a feasibility study, but um, we don't have a schematic design, uh, do we honestly believe that we would be spending as much, this is also with an assumption we have, land options? Do we honestly believe that in this year we would spend as much as $5 million? So this is <clears throat> this is one of the things we go back and forth on whether we should have the major capital projects on the, this JCPC list or not. Yeah. Some people say yes, we should. Some people say yes, we no, we shouldn't because it just it distorts everything. Um, that's a borrowing, so it doesn't really affect the actual capital for FY20. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of where our pl current plan has it. So we didn't we wanted to align this with the current plan, even but if. if once we know a little bit more information, we may be able to refine this a little in a little more detail relatively soon, I think. Um, so, and the same thing goes with the um, the 400,000 for the school. It, you know, it, that's a borrowing. Um, and, and the question was, would you make that a $440,000 borrowing or take 40,000 out of capital? Those are the, I mean, it's a very rich conversation. And it's very informative to me to hear the different perspectives, so. And then, just to complicate things, <laughs> let me throw in fire. And maybe I, this is just my not completely understanding the sequencing. I know obviously that the desired place for fire is where DPW is. Um, do we borrow for schematic designs? Do we have to borrow for schematic designs? And is there any logic to doing both a fire and a DPW schematic design, given that we would have locations for both, um, at the, basically going on at the same time, probably separate committees, but going on at the same time. And the reason I'm thinking of those and the importance of that is, first of all, it would help inform the feasibility studies that we already have, which are 
much more expensive than I think we realize we can spend. And it would help us figure out, can we build a stage DPW? Can we do a fire station that is, you know, five, 000, 5 million, 10 million less than what we have? So the sooner we can get those answers through feasibility, which also has to include for those two projects, the zero energy, because we didn't have that at the time we were doing the initial uh, feasibilities. So schematic design has to do that. So it's, in many ways, all of that is very informative for the council and the community to be able to say, this is what we can afford and this is what we can't afford. So I'm more eager to kind of put it all out there. Alex? So again, I think I always come back to these sort of process questions. So in past years, you know, we would get a budget, right? And the idea would be not to deal in esoteric bonding and grants. It was, here's money in hand, here's money to go out. And so I guess I worry. It's easy for us to say, could you just throw another 40 grand in and, you know, maybe we'll borrow on it? And I think that's a slippery slope that concerns me. So I think for me, as a committee, I would prefer, like, if, if, if we want to put 40000 in there, then we need to take it from somewhere else. We shouldn't say, let's borrow more, and that's just me trying to sort of toe the line, because we do have a lot of things out ahead of us, and I think it sets a dangerous precedent. So, um, you know, last year, again, not to pick on the roads, you know, last, I mean, 20000 is not going to make or break uh, Paul's million dollar in roads. So, mm -hmm. you know, do we just take the twenty grand, forty if we have to, and just put it in this and call it a day. Um, I guess I just like a more concrete solution than that um, because it shows perhaps the MSBA that we are committed to moving forward, to moving quickly with it. It shows the town people that we are committed to moving quickly, to moving forward with it um, versus just throwing it back on Paul to maybe borrow if it makes sense. Yeah. Go ahead. Eric. So, um, how, how certain are we on the $400,000 figure? So I believe that's based on our share, a million dollars. It's the same way it was structured last time um, with the Wildwood project. The, the overall cost budget was a million. We were, our share was roughly 40%-ish, and so that's where we came in. We came in under that budget um, by, I can't remember the exact amount. By around $40,000? <laughs> I can't remember that. So. The, re the reason I'm saying this is that the $400,000 figure is a placeholder anyway, and so I don't, I, I, I understand the point, but I would take it more, I would take it as more of an iron law if we were saying, let's give Dave Zomack his truck, and you know what I mean, we're going to say, we're gonna, let's, let's get the $60,000 conservation truck in here, because boy, we really need it, and then we can't just start, you know, Christmas tring or candy storing items and just throwing them in. In this case, the argument that's being made about the Crocker Farm study is that it's actually integral to the feasibility study, and the question is about the sequencing. I would actually rather just either put in $400,000 and then just provide, I hate to put this, <laughs> but direction to the school district to say, um, when, when, we're move, when we get accepted this December, you know, we're telling you this seems, this seems really promising. If it accelerates our work, let's try to move it forward. So maybe one of the first things that comes out of that $400,000 is some small piece of an analysis of Crocker uh, Farm School. Or alternately, if you think the actual number really is going to be closer to $420,000 in the end, then we should actually change the number from 400 to 420 because that's actually what the feasibility number is going to be. You know what I'm getting at? Yeah, I think it's a budget at this point. Uh, I'm looking out, I mean, there's a lot of things that are looked at in the feasibility study, so the 400,000 is just an estimate. If we added Crocker Farm as part of the feasibility study, would it increase it by 40,000? I don't know if it would, if it was in the original scope of what we're asking them to look at. Um, and again, given we, we had a uh, variance last time in our budget versus actual. So I think what I heard you say is just think include the Crocker Farm as sort of part of that borrowing for the feasibility study. Well, particularly if you're 20,000, if you said you had 20,000, I hate to use these words because they're bad words yeah. to use, but you said you had 20,000 extra kicking around right now. Right. 
and then it's possible this could come in yeah. for 20,000 under. Anyway. So, so, so here's, it, here's my thought of where we might go because we do need to get this moving along. Okay. We're talking about line 208 and um, I, maybe it's worth breaking it into two lines um, so that um, we put in an amount, move it to FY20, but shaded um, so that it's based upon borrowing. And we note in our recommendation that this is an amount that um, is uh, not, that, that would be um, subject to future council action to authorize the borrowing. Mm -hmm. So that nothing is really happening with it other than putting it on the spreadsheet and that we separately put a sum of money into a separate line, which we could call um, preliminary feasibility work or something like that. And whether it be 20 or $40,000, uh, but just put it in as a separate amount and make that recommendation to the manager. And then he has to decide whether he wants to include it in the budget and uh, also, as I noted earlier, will ultimately decide whether it's appropriate, as he does for any line, whether it's appropriate to spend it based upon the circumstances uh, when spending decisions actually have to be made. But at least we've put in a place where, the, where, where some money is available is what we're suggesting in, the, um, in this next year that is not subject to the borrowing. Yes. I just want a clarification on the last two points. That So the extra sum of money for the uh, citizen's request, is the is what I'm hearing that we would wait till December when we found out if we got into the MSBA to spend that, or, or would we spend it on July 1st to start moving forward with that study? I think that's a, that's a decision that's uh, ultimately the town managers right. to make. Because again, if we waited till December, then that sort of, in some ways, defeats the purpose of the time-saving piece of it, right? If you wait till you get into the feasibility study, then it wouldn't really make sense at that point to no, go ahead and do it. Because, um, or, or we'd know if we were included as part of the MSBA process. I think the saving piece is to start right away with it um, ahead of that. And again, that's, I'm just, that's what I heard, so I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that we don't know about uh, what would be the true cost of doing this, what would be the uh, parameters of the feasibility study that would be done, these are things that would have to be worked out sure. between with you and Mike and uh, Paul and his staff and uh, then he would make a decision okay. that would be appropriate but at least we've put a placeholder in there and put a sum of money in so that it can be done if it seems wise to be done and can move forward with uh, making those decisions. Okay. That, I, I was just going to say, I think that this is where we need to rely on our school committee and our superintendent that it seems like we want some money ready to spend and we're not the experts on when the best time to do that is if it is July, August and because it will save us six months of a feasibility when we get in the program in December, that makes total sense, you know, but if it wouldn't save us that time, then but but we're not, I'm not the expert on when the best yeah. time to do that uh, is. Right, and I want to move this along because I'm keeping an eye on the clock and I know the Loon has yeah. places to go. And I, I, I wanted to bring up here. the North Amherst Library building. Yeah, I was going to, so are we in a conclusion on that? And the only thing that's left is the amount, whether it be 20 or 40. Um, so the yeah. requesters had requested 40,000. I know, but we didn't. Uh, deal with that, but if we put it in 40, then we have the, we have the extra 20 and we could take 20 from the road. Um, Tony, real quick, because I'm really, I, I really want to move on to the next point. TSKP indicated yesterday evening that the estimate would be closer to 25 to 30 for this work. Put in 30. <laughs> <laughs> Split the difference? Yeah. Uh, Yes, Tammy. I just have one question for Sean. Where exactly are the drinking fountains? They're not listed as drinking fountains in your composite no. thing. What line are they in? Interior upgrades. 206. 
206. It went from 100,000 to 300,000. It's been really hard going through the sheets, as, as Mandy said, to figure out where things ended up. So that's why we're asking all these. That's fine. Apparently stupid questions, but you know, drinking fountains matter. Yeah. Um, no, and maybe, again, maybe next time we can figure out this report how to show the, the changes better. So Mandy, I, you wanted to take I, I wanted library. to bring up the North Amherst Library Rehab. It was slotted in as borrowing in FY22. I am curious. Um, the 800,000 is actually higher than any of the schematics came in with an estimated cost. Where the schematics came in, I think the highest schematic was like 550,000 or something, scheme C, um, number one. But it sounds like from the presentation last week and all that there is a sum of potential money that would cover potentially half of even that largest schematic amount, you know, somewhere in the $200,000, $250,000 range for doing a North Amherst library project, and that that money may not be available if we slot it into FY22. And while it's not necessarily in the scheme of the rest of our plan, the most important thing to do in FY20, if it makes sense monetarily, because if we did it in FY20 or FY21, we would gain a contribution of 200 and some thousand, which would then if, disappear if we slotted it into FY22 or 23. Fiscally, it might be most responsible to slot it into this year and figure it out. So I'd like to have that conversation. Do we know about how much private money might be available for this and all, and how much if we went forward this year versus in two or three years, would that save the town overall in doing something that I think most people agree, at least par partially needs done, which is ADA access and bathrooms? Well, so, um the true cost, the cost that you saw on that thing created by the, the report by Coon Riddle was just for the building. It had no site work, no other work, no, no way, no parking of facilities. So you basically, their estimate, and they were very clear that these are just ballpark per square foot numbers. They didn't get any more, any deeper into that, nor does it include some structural changes to that might need to be made to the building itself. So I think for the lowest cost is a half million, the highest cost is, is 500 to a million dollars is what we're sort of guessing at in terms of, so you sort of have to double the numbers that Coon Riddle had. Um, in terms of a potential gift, we have an anonymous donor who said uh, they may offer funds and it may be matched. That's not enough for me to move anything forward, I'm sorry. And uh, until someone says, I've got X number of dollars and then that's a, that's a legitimate conversation to have, but to change the capital plan to move and ask for half the funds, if that's what they're doing, for a half million dollars to come out of the town's coffers to prioritize this, if there's, if there's, a, if there's, if there's actual um, money being offered, I think that changes the conversation. But I have not seen that. I've heard um, offers of that. But again, no one has said a number. The numbers you said were the first times I've heard any numbers associated with that. I, I raised this before, and it, this is North Amherst Library, and that is that it just, it, it feels to me that that and the intersection have to be looked at hand in hand. I mean, I think you could do the changes within the building but if you're going to then bring in heavy equipment to reconfigure an intersection, having done a lot of gardening work or, uh, frankly, even parking lot work, um, often gets disturbed in the process of those kinds of additional work in the intersection. And I'm, I don't live in North Amherst. I do live in North Amherst. I don't live there, but I use that intersection all the time because of my association with the Survival Center. And somehow or another, that whole thing needs to be looked at together, and we need to have a plan. So. 
I don't know where when we do that, but and I understand your point, Paul, about the gift. I think uh, um, you know, money on the table is the only money we can count. Yes, Paul. So, so a plan is doable and achievable, and easily we we not easily we will we have done engineering work for the intersection combined with the other work, and I think you're right that we it should be looked at as a whole because if not this year, at some point we have to address the North Amherst Library. It just depends on what's the priority of that compared to all the other priorities you have on the table with you, for you. Uh, again, it's also borrowing most likely and that impacts you know, our whole big thing. Um, but the plan is, is something we will, you know, we have an engineering study that um, is being analyzed right now. Um, hopefully we'll get that out to everybody and have it be sort of reviewed a, a, a deeper way, um, but then it, it's going to be the significant amount of funds to implement that, or to do something. If we're not going, if that's not going to happen in the long term, do something in the short term. Right. Okay. I, I, I'd just like to say that this is a project that needs to be done. I understand um, all, all the difficulties with the intersection, and. I heard vaguely that there might be some money, but I never heard even the amount that Mandy is saying. Um, and and I, I agree that um, we can't move forward with the, the possible promise of money. Um, so I, I'm hoping that if someone is really interested that there will be something specific. But um, we are hopeful that this will get done in sooner than later. <laughs> Thank you. It's useful to know. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's a question that I would have, and then I say to Eric, is um, regardless of the scope in the end, the, the amount that, um, that we would need for this building, is it likely something that we would have to put into a bond? Um, and if so, then is it really just a question of where to put the placeholder? Because when um, the manager feels that there's a concrete plan that is a reasonable and responsible plan, which could be accelerated because this um, promise of possible money turns into a promise of real money, and that might change the equation um, with our, in our current form of government, uh, it doesn't take long to um, come say, I'm gonna move it forward and come to the council and ask to, authorize the bond and move forward with it. I'm not sure that we're, um, this is worth delving into and making a much finer decision. No, I mean, I, I was going to build on the points that have just been made that to my mind, um, as the town manager is, is uh, uh, firming up or finalizing sort of the timeline of the, the further sort of combined analysis or work that's being done around that intersection of the building. I think kn knowing, or having the council know, because it's probably not gonna be JCPC, knowing what that timing looks like and how it relates to FY20 and FY21 would be useful because honestly, if it's not, until it's synced up and you can move forward more concretely, then it might not make sense to, to move up the library renovations. Um, so just having a sense of that. But then I think that the, the second thing would be that, just so that there's no uh, misunderstanding, that if the town really needs a firmer plan for donations or commitment around donations, I think communicating that, whether it's the town manager or the, um, the library um, board, communicate, or the town council, communicating to them that you know, even if, even if, let's say, for sake of argument, these improvements couldn't be made until FY21 because of other work that needs to be done to be prepped in that area, even communicating, look, uh, if we're really gonna be serious about prioritizing this and moving it in FY21 on the basis of donations that are being made, we need to, we need a, you know, we, we have these expectations, I think would be, would just be helpful, right? Because it might actually firm up what that commitment needs to look like, and then which would then further allow the council or the town manager 
to then say, okay, great, now we have a, a roadmap for the next 24 or 28 months around what this would look like. Yes. There's a part of me that would say, we'll move this up to FY21, but we need the money in hand to keep it there. I think that uh, goes hand in hand with what Eric just said, yeah. because uh, what's really being said is, is that the uh, interest in doing something to address at least the most major concerns about the library is something that we think is important, but the timing depends on numerous things, and uh, if you have uh, more specific commitment to make, um, that's information to convey to the manager who can make the decision to alter, suggest an altered timeline. Yeah, I, please, but very quick, come on up, but please come to the microphone. Um, I think that, very quickly, that it's the anonymous donor needs to have money on the table before they can make uh, a, a concrete contribution. So they're looking for, or we are looking for, the people who do the petition, we are looking for money from the joint capital plan, and if we get it, we feel quite confident that we can uh, contribute, we'll know then what your, what capital plan is willing to put in, we'll know what we can put in. Yes. Paul, is the renovation of the North Amherst Library appropriate for CPAC money? I think it could be because it's, a, it's clearly a historic building. Okay. That's useful to know. Thank you. And could I get a clarification? Would would additions to a historic building because this isn't this isn't this is adding on to that building? Would that be allowable or not? I don't know. Yeah, I I think it would be useful to clarify. Yeah, and I would I would echo that actually what Paul's comment about the the. The ballpark estimates are new construction costs, and so doubling the estimate, um, so there are structural issues in adding an addition. So there are costs in the existing building that would have to be added on to, so there is the potential for a piece of it maybe being funded by CPAC. Um, the North Amherst Library has gotten those funds before. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, Eric. I may be bringing up something that starts getting more sensitive around how people talk about these things, but I do that all the time, so I'm used to it. Um, I, I'm just going to be given the comment that was just the public comment that was just made. I got to put a fine point on the idea that it's a bad place to be if community members sit and say, "I'm waiting for you to indicate you're in before I'm going to be committed to being in and sort of show my cards on what the money is." And then simultaneously, the committee to sit, well, you haven't really committed anything, so therefore I'm not going to commit anything either, right? Uh, so all I'm saying is offline, probably not in this committee or in this conversation. Uh, if, they're, if they're, and sadly, I think this has to come from the public before it comes from the council. Because I think, I think here, uh, either here or even for the town council, not to jump forward to what you guys do, um, it, We'd be spinning our wheels at the JCPC. The town council would be spinning their wheels to sort of just make up scenarios where they think they can match dollars to public dollars, um, which means privately and offline, um, the community, if it is in fact prepared to commit funds um, under certain circumstances, needs to come forward with a more specific um, proposal, probably needs in private to be able to reveal 
what those dollars figures would look like. And there's probably an upper boundary and a lower boundary. If there's a lower boundary of a private anonymous donor, um, and that's a bottom line figure that could be committed, then privately again, I would say, say what that figure is. Because for planning purposes, even if you think you can, I'm making this up, but even if you think you can raise um, $600,000, no, nobody in their right mind on a public committee is gonna start budgeting in terms of the upper boundary figure. They're gonna be looking at the lower boundary figure and then trying to say, all right, maybe I plus that up by 10 or 20% hoping that people come together for planning purposes. Um, but, but my point simply is, if there's a deal to be had, I think both the town manager and, and folks here anyways have expressed an interest in trying to find a deal. But it's not gonna happen unless people come together and they start actually expressing more firmer commitments that at some future point could mean that, that both the public says, all right, I'm in for this. And then there's an indication which would have to be debated publicly, right? So no one privately is gonna be able to say that the, either JCPC or the town council is in for a certain amount and commit it because it's gonna be a matter of public debate and vote, right? And it's gonna have to happen publicly. But there's gotta be at least a basis for forming an agreement that could then be vetted, discussed, and voted publicly. Yeah. I just want to clarify the numbers I was putting are not numbers I've heard. It was a more of a this. If we've got an offer of a quarter million or something, if that's like what's on the table, and I don't know what's on the table, if that's what's on the table, then and and the whole project is only a half million, so it would cost, it would pay for. It. It, I think those are what we have to figure out um, before we just push this off two years, especially if that would not be there. So. It sounds like we need more conversation offline about this. Yeah, again, real quick, Molly. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think the request has been made for private conversations. Uh, and so we agree with Mr. Bakajima uh, that we have to start there with private conversations. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. I mean, in the end, um, I'm going to get back to the focus here because what we're really recommending is how we're taking, budgeting the cash capital amount that we know is available for expenditure in FY20 and what recommendations we're making about it. The library um, request would not be a part of that money, which is where we started with the question of borrowing. And so it's been a useful discussion and it's been help, it was helpful that we had the citizen request to focus this group on the, um, but I think that at this point, it really is something that um, if the um, uh, group that is working uh, on trying to um, create a fundraising mechanism has something to provide to the manager and the manager determines that, hey, this is a feasible plan, uh, you can come to the council and make a proposal, it, um, but, but it's separate from the budget that he's presenting on May 1st. Uh, do I have that right? It, it depends on timing. If it happens before May 1st, um, you're making a recommendation based on the information you have today there's a little bit more time after you make your recommendation. Yep. Would it be helpful if I reviewed the proposed amendments to the FY20 plan, and then we can see if there's further amendments or if uh, the group wants to vote? Yes, um, and uh, um, just to, I think that the, uh, Mount for deep that I have to double check that Mount for DPW for the uh, sidewalk um, surveying for North Pleasant is still in the your, the recommendation. Oh, I mean it's not specifically spelled here, but you mean in the um, in the two hundred thousand dollars that were allocated allocated already to sidewalks, right? and I think it's what the transportation group has as a higher priority. It's, I know it's not specifically spelled out in our plan, I don't believe. Does that say, oh, there one that we yeah. just need to touch on to yeah. make sure we know where it is, I think? 
Yeah, 291. It would be in the sidewalk budget. It's a different budget. It's oh, 291. It so I think it's two line 291. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the change is okay if I go through the changes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So the changes that I've heard are I'm going to put the housing production plan back in with whatever that funding was, but shade it a different color so that it's clear that it's not coming from the, the levy. Um, what else? Um, so the feasibility study, we're going to create a new line. So we're going to move the $400,000 up from FY22 to FY20, make it a borrowing for a new feasibility study. And then we're going to create a new line for a preliminary feasibility study. Um, which will be 40,000, uh, maybe 30,000, based on what we heard, um, but the request for 40, so we can, we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, 40,000, what I heard is not from borrowing. We'll use the $20,000 sort of uh, surplus right now that's built into this plan to pay for that, and then the other 10,000 or 20,000 will have to come out of some other source, um, which will be left up to the town manager. Yes. And I think that's it. I think that's the only thing. The, the only other question I have, and this is really, uh, and it's the issue of whether or not we want to move the idea of the feasibility study for the fire station earlier. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. The schematic, schematic design, not feasibility. Yeah, I mean, my thoughts on that for both the DPW and the um, fire station. And, it, and it, you know, I looked to Paul on this too, is how does that relate in timing to the town council's discussion on sort of what the plan is going forward? Um, it relates big time. But I mean, do we want to recommend and approve it before the town council decides, yes, go ahead and do this? Here's the issue. The present feasibility studies for both of those are at high dollars. And in order for us to ever come up with any kind of way to reduce the footprint and the dollars for either DPW and fire is to go into schematic design because we can't do it by sitting here with a citizen group that doesn't, that aren't the designers, et cetera. I mean, it's, we have gotta put the zero energy in and we've gotta come up with a, a, a schematic design that says, okay, you could do this and then five years later, if you have money, you could do this or whatever, and we'll, we can't fill in on that wonderful tool that you're developing a realistic number at this point. With, without knowing harder numbers, it's gonna be hard for the council to make a capital plan for all the projects with dates and years and all of that. Right. Lynn, do you have a sense of how much that would cost? The number that I've always heard for schematic design was 250. That's what we went to town meeting for. But that was before we had to add in the solar issue, the whole issue of, of net zero. So I really leave that kind of guess to the manager. I mean, that was a, a number from, I don't know, three years ago that we took to town meeting. 250 for both? No, for each. For each. I, I have a question about the Station Road Bridge Line 287. Um, and I know the temporary bridge is running slightly behind schedule. I don't know what we've heard about our grant application for the bridge grant for a permanent bridge. You've slotted the permanent bridge funding borrowing into FY21. The original plan was to finish that permanent bridge at the very early stages of FY21, which would mean most of the borrowing, I think, would have to happen in FY20. So I'm curious where the thinking is on slotting it into FY21 versus FY20 in terms of borrowing. Are we looking at, because we didn't get it, just applying again next year, and so we've moved that permanent back a, a year? What's the timing on that now? So borrowing is just a, a, a source don't think about the timing of it. You don't need to think about it because we often will borrow small, small amounts of money through state house notes. And then when we have a, a sum of money that's worth it to go into the market, we'll put 10 things together and then go into the market. So we, can, we borrow through a, a, a system that the state has set up to borrow the money that we don't have, have to produce the cash. So in terms of um, 
what you're really well, what we this plan should really is would is really talking about is when will the money be spent and what is the source of the funds um, so that's so that's a key thing so if the money if we anticipate the money is going to be spent in FY 21 um, then that's the most likely scenario we don't know about um, a state grant coming in for that again that this is a type of thing where my philosophy is if there's state or other you know gifts that are coming forward that motivates a change in, in behavior for us but until we know that um, it will be on that we, we project it out at this point in time in FY21 um. yeah. I'm sorry that that this is the permanent not the temporary uh, just looking around. Yeah, Kathy, uh, just trying to handle a quick and stay on point, but we're, um, if you have something, since we've let others take me. Okay, I'm, I'm just staying on this point. You know, I have a couple of comments later, with, which may be more general. But when we discuss the permanent bridge at the Finance Committee, two rounds, and then brought it to the Council, we always talked about it with a grant. Um, and so the number was 500,000, not a million. And I know this is a placeholder, but we don't put the entire cost of a school on as a placeholder if we expect grant. And we even wrote the report back that con almost made it contingent on the grant. So I just think we should be budgeting, you know, as accurately as possible and that if we didn't get the grant in X year, it would be the next year um, because we were told the temporary bridge could last for four or five years. You know, it wasn't a one-year fix. So I, I just, it's a plea um, that goes with the earlier that I think we might not know 10 years worth of capital budget, but we ought to be able to think of two years worth at a time or three years that what do we really think is going to be in the next year so we can be moving it around. So. That was just a comment on this piece. Um, I've got a couple others, if you have time for a couple later, that I won't do now. Okay. Thank you. So back to the, your, do you have a specific recommendation, Lynn? No. Yes. I guess I was just going to ask whether you heard some summary point around uh, schematic design, for a new schematic design for, or schematic design, I should say, for a fire station or DPW, or is that something that, in your view, the JCPC was bringing up and sort of, um, for want of a better way of phrasing it, punting over to the town manager to get further thoughts, or? Or is that, where is that, uh, where did that land? I personally would like to see us have the capability, should the opportunity arise in this next fiscal year, to move to schematic design for pub both public works and the fire station. We've already discussed the school, and we've already made that decision. And um, I think that both of those um, are, well, they might be borrowing, and they may cost 250, they may cost 300,000. Uh, I think it's going to be critical for both of those to be able to go forward as fast as possible so that the council can actually come up with a comprehensive capital plan. So my question is, can you do that without having an identified location for the DPW facility? You cannot do any schematic design without having an identified location. So, so it's, it's a placeholder, hoping that we have a... So I'm here, I mean, the recommendation, and you guys can say if you want to, to do it, is to move the 500,000, either split it or move it up to FY20. That's already there for the fire station. And, and I also question whether if we don't even have a site yet for DPW and we don't have a schematic design, what would we be spending a half, you know, $5 million on? So in some ways, unless we're going to repair. And so I'm, I've questioned the 500, the 5 million for DPW in FY20. I think it's a little further out. Although, to be honest with you, my concern in general over interest rates is that I think we're going to start seeing them go up. So 
I'd rather start moving. So do I take it that the, right, that the suggestion is that we move the um, feasibility study earlier and uh, shaded with borrowing with sort of the same understanding that we put in with the school feasibility study. doesn't mm -hmm. need to be repeated, but then um, just when it's appropriate, when we have, one is if we get into the MSBA process, the other is if we find a piece of land for DPW, that those are triggers that then would authorize um, proceeding immediately to come up with uh, bond, uh, a request to the council and to move forward. Could, I guess that's yeah. just a question of what year then. Could I ask, I think, in, to go back to just the 10-year plan and how it looks on this very first page, it would probably be helpful to pull out all of any major building project, whether it's schools, library, you know, that, um, North Amherst Library in a, um, and the Senior Center or anything like that out with a projected timeline for the borrowing of that, but then a line underneath that shows what the payments, the debt obligation would be under that borrowing so that we can specifically see here's what, because that's the debt, the debt obligation is what comes out of this 10% or our capital and that's where we're having real problems sort of seen, so I think it would be helpful to have a line that's like, here's your big major building projects, and here's if we borrow in these years, what the debt obligation going forward for those specifically are. Yeah, so um, so that's sort of what the, the tool will do, and we can plug it in, and I think in some ways it's also helpful, maybe it's a different section, to just do that with any other debt projects as well, not just the building projects, but other things we authorize for debt. So you can see if we approve two million for something, how does that impact future amounts? So probably both of those would be a good idea for upgrades. I just, again, I want to reinforce the fact that this, I know, plays hand in hand with the tool, okay? That's absolutely critical. But the other piece is that as we approach what we're now looking at, which is a June 10th meeting, on the comprehensive nature of our capital thinking, part of what we take forward is this year, next five years, and even you know some statement at least about the status of the tool. What I think we're all suggesting is communicating to the public that we're not, we didn't just take, take a vote on Monday night, um, we're moving to make a commitment to figure out what we're going to do with all of this. But I actually think that we're uh, getting back to the focus of the day, and that is what are we recommending to be spent in FY20? I think we're pretty well there. and. Uh, but we're, uh, these have been very helpful suggestions about how to structure either potential additional requests that are dependent upon borrowing or presentation for uh, of the document in future years, and we need to work those out. And I, you know, uh, we can get a small group to work with either uh, Paul or Sean, but I think that for the work of trying to figure out, do we support the recommendation? What changes would we propose to get there for the FY20 recommendation? But we're, we're really there, and um, we may be that there's nothing more that we can take up today. So we come, this comes back to us, and then we make well, We were going to have an additional meeting, um, I this is uh, to, uh, Thursday, um, like the, the 11th? No. Um, it's going to be like three weeks, I think. The three weeks, <laughs> yeah. 27th. I didn't remember the act. I was going to say the 25th, but I knew that wasn't right. Um, and come back at that point um, about 
sort of this cleanup questions that we're talking about, but that we wanted to have the concrete recommendation that we're making for FY20 to the manager so that he can start working with that in his budget request. The 27th is a Saturday. It's the 25th. I thought it was the 25th, okay, was the 25th but I wasn't okay. sure. That's and it's at our regular time. Yes. So, um, the, the, um, turn to Paul and Sean and say, do you feel that we've done what we need to do for this point to allow you to move forward with the FY20 budget development that you need to do? Yeah, well, um, I think we'll make the changes that we've heard. I've also heard take a closer look at the next five years and maybe do a little cleanup there. Some of the things, some of the questions that were raised around you know, the portable radios being every year and some of the other recurring things, clean that up a little bit more. Um, and, and there's a couple decisions the town manager will have to make about where money, where funding comes from, but I think I hear mostly consensus on the recommendation, so. Um, I just wanna say that that, that public forum is you know, something we've never done before. Uh, we just started discussing it the other day and what would it look like, and I think it's gonna be a public forum that there's gonna be a lot of interest in. So I think the more that we can make this picture um, reflect current thinking, the better. Thank you for all of your work, both of you. This has been amazing. So, uh, Paul, do you have any Final, okay. So what I would suggest then is for this committee, and then I'll see if Kathy has anything, um, just give her a chance for public comment to conclude, but um, that uh, try and see what we can, you can do on the spreadsheet in relation to what we've talked about today. And um, if it comes, you know, if you need to consult and I'm not available because I'm out of town for those 10 days, then um, check with Alex because she's vice chair. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we don't. You're basically out of town at the same time. Is this just on cleaning up the spreadsheet for the recommendations that were made, Andy? Yes. Yeah, I think I've got them. I'll, I'll maybe to you to take a final look at, make sure I captured everything, but. Okay. Yeah. Before he leaves before he leaves the country. Where are you going? Does this place not have technology? Neither are planning to participate remotely. Good for them. <laughs> um, so, Kathy. Okay, I'll, I'll just keep it really short because you touched most of the issues I was gonna raise. Um, I thought we heard, can you, you all see me? Can I roll this? Um, I thought we heard one other idea from citizens that was interesting and it had a small price tag, the golf course clubhouse idea. And at the end of his presentation, he was saying, you know, it was like in the ten or $20,000 range, they could do a, what could happen there. And I think it's a potential money maker for the town. So it's, it's an initial investment um, with the increase in population in North Amherst. He was right about the demise. But we might have a community space that could be rented out so the golf course could supplement and be used for community. So it's, if there is squish room in the budget for that, I think it, it was a really smart idea. Then the other comment I had is, I have, I have a visual that I can share with people. The cover of the New Yorker uh, has a road going in with a curve taking people back out saying no vacancy. And we're about to get in North Amherst, the uh, traffic study that was done for the new development said 2,000 more trips per day added to the 5,000 that are already going through the intersection. So one of the pleas I have, it's not penciled in until next year. Uh, the whole discussion at that intersection, I went back to DPW minutes from 2015 that said a smart light would help and we'll do it next year, so that was four years ago. And a smart light would have a green signal so you won't be backed up forever and alternative reds and greens allowing flow. So in that road budget, potentially at least the light could come in. So just trying to think of 
as we do new developments in town, what infrastructure do we need before we open them up? The development opens this August, uh, and then it fills up in November. So we're in a real year when those 2,000 trips a day are going to happen. So that, that was my other just, I don't think it requires a change in the budget, because we went up on roads, and I, my understanding of light could be in there, but starting to think about that rather than saying maybe in the future. My other comment um, relates to all the suggestions, which I think were excellent at getting about more real about the future years. If we think roads will always have to be, or for the next five years, have to be no lower than 500,000, I don't know what the number is, put that number in, because we really need it when we're thinking about the big capital projects. You know, we can't say we're going to do a building, and but the next five years never repair a road. So just trying to think of those lines going out, if, if it's five years, I don't know what the right is, but Paul said we need $2 million a year for five years. And I said, well, what if we had one and a half between chapter 90? But that's that look out, Sean, on get as real as we can on those will be extremely helpful for the other things we're working with. That's it. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, now, I'm glad you brought up the golf course because we didn't talk about that one. I think we had sort of last time concluded the, with the thought that we really needed more input from LSSC and uh, that it wasn't, that it was something that was really worth uh, giving some serious consideration to, but that uh, we weren't really likely to get a kind of a specific enough proposal to have a dollar amount to even consider putting in for this year and how to put it in for this year. So I think that's where we ended up. Yeah. Yes. And my, my, my recollection that builds on that is that <clears throat> when it comes to the dollar amounts requested for actual improvements, um, that there really wasn't enough of a plan put together, which by the admission of the proponent. So it's not in any way a criticism. And so then the question ended up being, which we actually raised during the session, um, was uh, what, what, is, what does LSE need to be able to do some kind of a reasonable planning process so that next year they can come forward with either operational or other facility changes that could take advantage of the opportunity. And I think, I think literally what happened is we, we were punting it to the town manager to, to follow up on. But I think, so I think the, the only point I'd make on this is I actually think that the committee, at least in the discussion we had, um, agreed with uh, the counselor that um, this is something worth following up on and doing something about. We just weren't sure what the amount was. We knew it wasn't 300,000 or something, so, but, but if it's even five or 10,000, we didn't know what that number was to try to figure out how do we make enough progress so that we can then move into operational plans in some ways as soon as we're able to. It's the amount for the study yeah. to come up with it that we're looking for. And I, I'm going to ask the question, is that also a JC, I mean, a CPAC kind of project? It's recreational. Okay. Okay, and um, getting back to in the end, I think we always are stuck with this question that um, the ultimate decisions about what roads to do, and this kind of gets back to the crosswalk request for him, uh, Ms. Usher, is that we put in an amount for roads and sidewalks. The decision ultimately on how that money gets spent is done administratively in consultation with the Transportation Advisory Committee under the current um, practice that we have. And uh, but, so at this point, we do want to move forward. And of course, then the other questions, which we don't want to get into now because we want to adjourn, is uh, the question of uh, where we are with mass works and whether that's still a possibility or whether we need to think about plan B, and uh, I don't want to delve into that now because that'd be another chunk of discussion and I think we need to adjourn. 
So anything else before adjournment? So I just want to clarify, our next meeting is the 25th. Yes. The, whatever the Thursday is, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, motion to adjourn? I think we all adjourn? agreed. Adjourn. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, we're adjourned at 1033.